Now, the first presentation for today will be held by Dr. Mark Daniel Jaeger. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Security Studies at the ETH Zurich from Switzerland. And he uh, will provide us with the speech, uh, Conventional and New Challenges in uh, Security Politics Today. So I'm very interested in having a general note on that. Please, Daniel. Come up here. <laughs> what is this? Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Pirate, the Pirate Party uh, for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a talk about um, security politics and uh, the conventional and new challenges to it. Um, now, the conference topic today is um, security politics since known. And um, this, this, this framing inter indicates a, a watershed, an event that had significant impact in the course of history. And frequently, the immediate reaction to such events is to perceive them as causing profound change. Nothing is the way it, it, was, it, it used to be. However, this is a one-sided view. Instead, these watershed moments are also culmination points of important developments that reach back many years. And in order to properly understand such momentous events, we need to consider both change and continuity. But what makes challenges new rather than conventional? There are two things. First, obviously their shape, that is the new physical or material properties. Yet even more than that, challenges are new by our perception of them, the way we observe phenomena, profoundly influences the way we understand them. Thus, our conceptual approach greatly matters. So the aim of my talk is to contextualize today's and tomorrow's conference topics. My talk is divided into two parts. First, I will trace the evolution of um, conceptual lenses that are now dominating security politics. And in the second part, I then will indicate how these conceptual lenses are entirely shaping our political discourse on security threats. So as you, as you note, my presentation is going to be a huge part about um, conceptual approaches and concepts. And um, it's going to be complicated, but um, I ask you to bear with me because I think these concepts are fundamentally important for um, today's security politics and for the practices involved in them. So let's come to the first part, contextualizing security politics. Present security politics differ decisively from what the world looked like 20 to 30 years ago. Then in international security, politicians and academic analysts alike were accustomed to the certainties of the Cold War. There was an obvious adversary with presumed hostile intentions and obvious capabilities. And as you see, you, you can call this the triangle of certainty. So there was the perception of a clear enemy. We knew who the enemy was. Then there were hostile intentions. And we also thought we knew that this enemy had very high capabilities. So international politics appeared as a bipolar matter between two superpowers whose deadly nuclear arsenals simply forced international actors to limit any ambitions and constrain their behavior. And with the sudden and for many observers surprising end of the Cold War, some researchers such as Fukuyama, for instance, even proclaimed an end of history. At last, the known enemy was gone. Now, even while today, today's security politics look profoundly different, 
past certainties are gone, and any suggestion of imminent eternal peace appear far-fetched, to say the least. Some key traits date back to these last decades of the 20th century. On the one hand, already during the Cold War, there was substantial dissatisfaction with ignoring any issue as potential security problem that was beyond the narrow military focus of nuke-sponsored international security. For instance, environmental concerns were one prominent issue that was that put pressure on widening the focus of security politics. Soon others joined in, such as migration or economic security. Now accordingly with the end of the Cold War, there was a significant widening of what security politics means, in many cases with noble intentions, such as protecting the environment, if you think of nuclear energy. Such widening was accompanied by a deepening as security politics were meant to refer not merely to the state, but deeper to the individual, individual human security. And humanitarian in interventions were a direct symptom of this development. On the other hand, the widening and deepening towards new themes and threats was accompanied by a crucial rise of new concept conceptual lenses in security politics. The new threats are characterized by uncertainty. They often do not feature a clearly identifiable actor or a hostile intention or, cle or clear capabilities. Instead, if you think of terrorist sleeper cells or things like that, and that's, that's the general view on it, it's unclear who the actual actor is. It's unclear what his immediate intentions are. And it's even more unclear what his actual capabilities are. And this perceived uncertainty required different conceptual approaches to dangers. As a consequence, notions like risk and precaution profoundly changed how challenges in security politics are perceived and understood. Risk, as the first conceptual inno innovation, led to a further expansion of security politics, not towards new themes, but in terms of time. Traditionally, security politics were reactive, nicely exemplified by the principle of mutually assured destruction during the Cold War. If you de destroy us, we just make sure we can still destroy you as a response. With the notion of risk then, security politics became proactive about anticipating threats and possibly preventing them from materializing. So risk was a, a true game changer as, as a conceptual lens in security politics, one that seemed able to cope with growing uncertainties and applicable to the challenges such as transnational terrorist threats. And as you know, risk is the product of potential damage and um, its probability. So, and, and therein this anticipatory, this future directed um, view is incorporated. However, risk-based policies come with their own peculiar demands. In order to obtain the best possible result, risk rationalities are driven by an insatiable appetite for information. So, and for all his, you know, infamous deeds and detestable justifications, Donald Rumsfeld perfectly captured the conundrum of risk-based security politics. Let's, let's have a look at what he said. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just I'm not this going, is an I'm not going to say which it is. The You know, right here. Okay. Actually, we should be careful in giving Rumsfeld credit for you know framing the problem this way because obviously he <laughs> didn't frame it, but one of his his advisors. But um, let's 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 re let's have a look at what he said. So there there are known knowns, and that's known knowns. That's the certain knowledge. You know, that's that's. That's the triangle of certainty. That, that is, these are the enemies we know, we know their capabilities, and we know their intentions. That's the idea behind the known knowns. And then there are the known unknowns. That's the knowledge about what we do not know. These are the uncertainties, basically, that can be tamed uh, for risk policies. And uh, but there's a third element, actually, that there are the unknown unknowns. 
the things we do not know, we don't know. <laughs> and this, this, this third element actually is the wild card. That's the true enemy of risk policies. Because when you have unknown, no, when, when you have these unknown unknowns, then you can, your whole calculation becomes pointless. You have, there's something else going on you, you didn't even know about. And the implications of this conundrum then, risk policies aim to reduce uncertainty as much as possible by maximizing knowledge. The more information, the better. Now applying the concept of risks of risk may thus serve to justify an ever-increasing amount of information gathering, i.e. surveillance. However, risk policies are haunted by doubt and irre irre that irreducibly remains. As I said, the unknown unknowns, you can never ensure that, these, that, there, are, that there are not any unknown unknowns out there you, can, you just didn't know about. And again, the basis of risk policies the damage and its probability also reveal the limitations of this conceptual lens. If the potential amount of damage becomes infinite, then any risk calculation becomes pointless. So if you, if you imagine, and that was what was actually occurring um, ahead of the, of the Iraq war, when President Bush was talking about mushroom clouds above, above American cities, that's exactly infinite damage. And then you can calculate whatever you want. It's, it's pointless. Now, in this situation, the precautionary principle comes in. And that's the second conceptual lens that gained ground in security politics. It is specifically applied to situations of possibly infinite damage. And this concept, again, dates back to the 70s when it gained prominence in the environmental sector, an area that falls into the widened security politics today. And the logic of the precautionary principle is where there are threats of serious irreversible damage, lack of certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing preventive measures. And if you think about nuclear energy, for instance, then one can see why this precautionary principle gained ground in some areas. Because, you know, if in, ca in, in case of catastrophe, sometimes the damage is just too high. It's, it's not justifiable. And that's exactly why Germany... Um, decided to, to quit from nuclear energy. But if you transfer this principle to security politics in general, then it becomes much more problematic. Because with, with the precautionary principle, decision-making switches its basis. Decisive for, talking, for taking preventive measures is the mere possibility that an event might, might occur, and not in any way its probability. Thus, the political implications of the precautionary threat politics are with the precautionary principle, the possibility of catastrophe, however remote, it, it needs to be a possibility only, is enough to justify taking extraordinary preventive steps. And arguably, this was exactly the rationale behind the Iraq war, for, for example. Now, the lessons from this. Both risk and precaution are conceptual lenses in security politics that request expanding security-related re states' competences. First, risk rationalities demand a maximization of, informational, of the informational basis. Then, precaution on its part requests an expansion of preventive measures. And also, there's a third implication, a conceptual implication, actually. Once you enter, these, once you enter these, this way of of perceiving dangers and of the way of viewing things, then there's no way, there's, there's hardly any way to return to, to the innocence of, say, reactive security politics, because not taking a decision on a risk, of course, is also risk again. So it's, it's really hard to escape this, 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 um, yeah, this, this logic of, of, of the, the logic of these, of these um, concepts. Now, if we apply this to um, contemporary security politics, this conference is about security politics since known. And you might still wonder why I gave such a long talk about the past, even when it is a past that is obsessed with proactively taming the future. The reason is that this past and its conceptions that rose in it exceedingly define our present. The concept of risk and precaution grew popular exactly because they fit quite well to the supposedly new dangers of a widening and deepening agenda in security politics. 
terrorism, transnational crime, and yes, cyber threats as well. As well. Now let's proceed to the core of today's um, conference theme. As you of course know, the developments taking place over the past years that I have outlined were conjoined by an additional revolutionary change, the rise of the Digital Network Society. Now in my view there are two basic traits of the, of the Network Society that, that are highly relevant here. First, it's the sheer amount of data that is produced daily and the enormous amount of information that can be deduced from this data. And the second trait is its connectivity, that, that every aspect of society, every sector is interconnected, and that creates a, a lot of interdependence, and it also creates dependence on these uh, networks. These traits, on the one hand, then serve These traits, on the one hand, serve the operating needs of risk rationalities. With the, with the widespread use of data networks and the related communication technologies by the entire population, an invaluable source of information becomes accessible to risk analysis. And with the con conceptual lenses, the data produced by information and communication technologies are a giant irresistible honeypot. On the other hand, the Digital Network Society's own traits provide further grounds for justifying the application of risk rationalities. Critical sectors of the economy are now heavily relying on internet and deemed vulnerable to disruptions. Other infrastructures, even when not depending on the same extent on the internet, are still connected and thus possibly susceptible to um, disruptions. Sorry, I was a bit going a bit too fast. Exactly. So the implications are that both aspects, the honeypot and the societal dependence on, net, on networks, further universalize security politics. The explosion of the amount of data that is readily available invites population-based methods of deducing information from data. And the prospect of unknown unknowns, the wild card, further encourages surveying and analyzing more and more information and actually imposing extraordinary measures. Moreover, with critical infrastructures, what is decisive for criticality is the potential and not the probability. So this resonates largely and strongly with the precautionary principle again. And by securitizing infrastructures that, such as the financial industry as critical, that means a regulatory move. It bears legal consequences for certain activities conducted on the internet, as you probably know. For example, there was Operation Avenge Assange by Anonymous in late 2010. And uh, it involved attacking um, finance firms like MasterCard and Visa firms from the financial sector. And of course you can you could you could have labeled that as a as a show of as a show of public protest or even maybe vandalism. But it was far from that, it was labeled a security threat. And it was exactly labeled a security threat because anything that potentially inhibits the functioning of critical infrastructures is a threat. Also against this background, it seems ironic, to say the least, that behind, besides protecting critical infrastructures, guarantee the integrity, authenticity, and privacy of data is a key goal of the German cybersecurity strategy. So there's a big dilemma between between, as, as, we, as we just heard, heard in the opening um, speech, between protecting privacy of data and individual rights and, and serving the needs of these conceptual lenses. And this tension between privacy of data and exploiting it for security reasons is part of a conflict that runs through different institutional branches of the, of the state itself, actually. So surveillance in general terms seems no longer questioned. Only its extent and the legal caveats remain contested issues, with the federal court repeatedly ruling in favor of privacy rights. While legal surveillance competences were significantly extended, such as with the BKA law from 2009 and the Bestandsdatenauskunft in 2013, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of them, the federal court, on the other hand, 
established in 2008 a new fundamental right warranting the confidentiality and integrity of information technology. In line with that, it also established a high threshold for preventive covered online searches. And this high threshold, of course, is compared to other countries. You can still discuss if it's really a high threshold that exists, actually. And now the problem, of course, is that the current practices fall significantly short of these requirements, with double-digit increases in the percentage of communication interceptions over the recent years, in particular under the so-called Article 10 law, which limits the privacy of correspondence, post- and telecommunications. Now, but this brings me to my final point. Entgrenzung, <laughs> the obliteration of traditional borders. If we, if we are pulling together widening, deepening, and the digitalization of security politics, the perhaps most fundamental aspect of today's world is the that new level of complexity it's, it generates. The point about the privacy of data in the national cybersecurity strategy certainly was less about its potential compromising by, by the agencies of, of the own state initially. It was more meant to be about potential attacks by state adversaries like transnational crime networks or the like, which is not to say that this whole dilemma is not problematic to, high, to the highest extent. Along with the internet becoming a critical element to almost every aspect of a society, it also knows, grows more attractive for using it as a weapon in interstate conflicts. And perhaps the Ukraine crisis provides a telling example for this new complexity and for this obliteration of borders. So besides Russia as a state adversary in the perception of most politicians, the conflict includes local groups and it is also playing out in cyberspace as a recent attack on the website of the Bundesregierung demonstrates. So there's this, this whole new mixture of different levels of, of um, of politics involved in, in, in the new security field. So to emphasize that point, in spite of all the changes that I've just mentioned, old and traditional interstate security politics did not just, just disappear. Rather, they contribute to the new level of complexity augmented by particular technological properties of the internet, like difficulties of identifying attackers and so on. So for the conclusions, the societal challenges of contemporary security politics, in my view the most fundamental challenge is reconciling privacy rights with the conceptual lenses of widening, deepening and digitalizing security agendas. So in my view the challenge is not, does not only lie in the potential threats that security politics currently has to deal with, but rather, rather and much more so the real challenge lies in finding a new societal consensus that squares the circle between information requests of the conceptual lenses and protecting privacy rights. And the key question, the key political question of our time in security politics is perhaps, how can we defend open society? Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, do we have a microphone? Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Julian Traublinger from Berchtesgadener Land. Uh, I, I answered to, a, or I commented an article of a colleague of your, I think uh, he was, uh, on NZZ online, mm -hmm. and he defended or he uh, he reported about uh, the necessities of uh, or the interests of the security interests of the U.S. and like said roughly, uh, don't uh, don't uh, save money in the in the defense sector. The defense sector, uh, and because that could weaken the military strength of the U.S. And on the on the one hand, he says, "Yeah, U U.S. military is uh, is very strong; is is the strongest in the world." On the other hand, don't uh, save money, and it was like 
for example, he said uh, Vorwärtsverteidigung instead of Angriffskrieg. Yeah? And I criticized that and I, I found it Orwellian that he as a, as a mm -hmm. professional security researcher uh, has this position. So um, if I understood you correctly, the position was that he, he was arguing in favor of, of um, I don't know, some surveillance techniques and things like that. And or, or was, he, was he arguing in favor of these techniques and yeah, spending uh, less? Yeah, generally the, 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 the mighty of, of the army, like, yeah. so to be, uh, to be <laughs> and it is threatened to terroristic, terroristic th threats and so on. Also, okay, so, um, so what he argued was that the terrorist threats are actually, or the, these asymmetrical threats are higher than tra traditional threats and, that's, and, and that the focus of, you know, spending so much money on the army was, was wrong and should be spent on... No, no, the other way around. <laughs> so the, the army should be strengthened. Uh -huh. Don't, don't uh, save money on the army. Okay. And so that uh, I found Orwellian because he, he mm. uh, re does research about security and argues for the war. Yeah. So it, it was like a word. Sure, he sure sh you, you are sure he was from my institute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> Do you remember his name? <laughs> no, but it's still in. It's still online. Yeah. Okay. But. Uh, Probably well, a um, question for the uh, next break. Another question. Hi, my name is Monica Ermert. I'm a journalist. Uh, when you, s uh, you, you said the, the most important question is how to protect open society, could you define open society for us? Um, well, open society, I would define open society as a society that that doesn't have to fear for the privacy of its, its correspondence, for instance, that you don't have to think about what are you posting on Facebook and who's going to read that and so on, if, for, especially for political, re for, for political posting. So if, if, you, if you want to state your opinion on Facebook or whatever in, in the internet, on political issues, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to worry about who else is reading this information. That's one part. And also if you, if you think how most of the surveillance is going on in terms of you know metadata collection, collection and, and analysis and um, you know just pinpointing the dots together via algorithms. It's it's not only about what you actually communicate, but also with whom. So and that's 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 actually the most valuable information currently. I guess that's it's it's more about you know knowing who's going who's communicating with whom, and it's also important, of course, to know what they are talking about, but. It's already highly informative to know who's talking with whom, and then you, 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 you get a certain network, and you draw conclusions from this network, often via al algorithms. And algorithm, algorithms <laughs> are, of course, an issue in themselves because um, they're, they're based on correlations. And to draw causal inferences based on correlations is highly problematic. So, and if you have all this, all these elements of, of a certain dis security dispositive, then this, in my view, is problematic for, for the openness of society and for the, for the democratic foundations of society because it inhibits open debate and it's in, ultimately it's inhibiting to, to exercising your, your, your basic freedoms, your freedom of speech and so on. And if I might add to this, um, I decided to talk so much about these conceptual lenses because I feel that this is where the core problem is or what, what needs to be tackled. I don't say that you can just um, abolish these conceptual lenses, lenses, but you need to understand what the requests of these conceptual lenses are. That This is where this request for ever more information comes from. And this is the real problem you have, this is the, th the, sorry, the circle you have to square between you know, individual rights and, and privacy of information and these requests by, by these conceptual lenses. Can I have a follow-up? Follow are there any um, 
kind of alternative uh, proposals how um, the, the new security policy should go about that indefinite risk stuff um, then? Yes, certainly. In, in academia, there's a lot of there are a lot of discussions going about desecuritization, you know, about questioning what we actually call a security threat and how, why we, we were calling it a security threat. But it's only in academia. And also, uh, unfortunately, in my view, mo mostly yes. And, and also, it's, it's about what we call a security threat and about, and about what the effects of calling it a security threat are. And mostly, if you, call, if you label something a security threat, the consequences are rather dire in, case, in, 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 in terms of you know, legitimizing extraordinary measures, which are usually measures that are beyond the usual rules of politics. So if you, if, if you, start, by, if you start your analysis by already labeling something a security threat, then you immediately drift into a very specific direction that's, 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 that means to, 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 circum, to circumscribe circ certain, certain usual rules of the, of, of the political discussion. For instance, you, you, have a, you have a completely different way of discussing dire security threats than you have about discussing other political problems. You know, you, you, don't have, you have less reflection, you have a less extensive parliamentary debate, it's much more difficult to voice opposition if, you, if, if it's against a strong security threat. And I think, again, the Iraq war showed what this actually was about, because, or means what, it's, what this actually means, because if you, if you remember, ahead of the Iraq war, there was in the US a very strong, a very strong urge to agree with the policies and politics of the, of the administration, and even even Democrats, even very liberal Democrats, were hesitating to question these policies because of the of the of the public pressure you received by by standing up against something being labeled a security threat. My name is Hans Georg Klee, and I am engaged with the traditional peace movement. Um, in your opening. Uh, uh, statement you talked about the balance between security and freedom. Obviously, I was missing the issues of peace and nonviolence. Uh, and I want to ask you how would you relate these other two terms, security and freedom, to this uh, also values of a modern society, uh, peace and nonviolence? Thank you. Ah, it's working again. Um. These are very fundamental questions, actually. Um, I think if you, if you gain peace by abolishing freedoms, it's, it's not really worth the peace, actually. And of course, it's, 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 a, it's a dilemma. It's also, it's always, you have to find the middle ground. You have to find the middle ground between, not between violence and peace, but between, you know, balancing, as, as, as was said in the, in the opening statement. Um, you, have, you have to balance, you have to find a compromise or a balance between, you know, providing peace and security and, and, and still having, having individual liberty safeguarded. But um, it's, if, if you if you then look, then look at the policies that that are driven by either side of of, of, the, of these views, they of course they largely diverge, and, and and often you know very violent policies are justified on on basis of freedoms, defending freedoms, defending peace, and so on. And yeah, it's 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 a, it's a hard compromise you can you have to draw. I don't know if, 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 if I answered your question or, it, or maybe if you can pose it a bit more specifically, then I might come up with a, with a better answer. I wanted to know how you related together, so you answered my question. Okay. I, I do not agree exactly with you, but that would be a deeper discussion maybe afterwards yeah. over yeah. a night of coffee or so. Other questions? 
Yeah, just a second. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> in your speech, I missed uh, the fourth known thing, the unknown knowns. And uh, for my end in the community, it's uh, the most fearsome unknown, because that means uh, you have storage of all these data, and you will go through it again and again and again with new ways of uh, analysis um, that compromises maybe years later a person to one of these uh, thinkable risks. Um, was, was that a comment or a question? Yeah, the question is, um, do you forget it or is there a special intention? No, 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 of course, of course. I, I didn't mean to, to, you know, to not, or to dispute that. That's exactly the point. If you have these unknown unknowns, where do you stop? Or when do you stop? And of course the implications are not just on today, but they're, as you said, they're going to the future. So it's, I, I talk about the unknown knowns. Means if you, for example, name the, the uh, okay. Han for uh, Bin Laden, the information lead to his um, hiding place was over years uh, in the uh, data hmm. uh, <coughs> proceeding of, of uh, several agencies. So, but at the moment they need it, they don't know that they had them. And that means you go through again and again and again hmm. through your data, uh, analyzing it again and again. So you refer that, to... That is, that is normally, um, if, if, they, if the security agencies wants money, hmm. uh, that is one of their uh, yeah, mostly used uh, arguments uh, to, hmm. to get money. To be able to... And to, to hold it uh, to secret. To store course. the, da yeah, the yeah. data. To store the data and to analyze it again and again. <laughs> um, sure, but... Um, so it's your argument against forward Datenspeicherung. I, I, I still, I still found, find it difficult to, to... I agree with you. Of course, of course, this is a motive. As, as I said, this, this appetite for information is insatiable and... And it's the more you get, the more data you get, the better. That's the, that's the whole logic. And it's difficult to say, okay, you get this, but you don't get more. Because you can always ask, oh, you know, there might be known unknowns, or there might even be unknown unknowns at our current point of time. But, you know, with a new algorithm or some, something like that, we can perhaps tackle some unknown unknowns. It's, it's, that's the conundrum that you have to tackle somehow. But that's a political question, entirely. Any further questions? Seems not like. Then I would like to thank you again. Thank, thank you. you very much, Dr. Daniel Eger.